this session. It's called Two Weeks is Too Long. Uh, my goal here is to, if nothing else, get us asking the question of why are we still doing two week deployments and two week release cycles or four week release cycles and question if there's a better way we could be doing it. Um, I'll go through some practical examples of uh, some of the successes that we've had with it, some of the ways that we use feature flags, what feature flags are, uh, and, and how to incorporate it. And uh, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have some ideas on how you can move things faster or what you might need to put in place to, to, to kind of break this cycle and ultimately deliver more value for your customers or, or yourselves. So with that, uh, my name is John Doyle. I'm the CEO of Digital Polygon. Uh, we do a lot of uh, web-based uh, development. My entire background is Drupal, uh, but I have been doing a lot of other CMS work and uh, a lot of headless sites recently. Um, so I've done a couple talks on, on headless as well. And this kind of plays into this composable nature, which I think Drupal is a really, really great uh, vehicle for. Uh, outside of that, uh, I love hiking and snowboarding and uh, yeah. sailing the seven seas. And I, I just learned about filter coffee uh, in Belgium, of all places. Uh, so like not just, I put it, my, my ground coffee in, in a coffee filter, but there's some way that they do uh, the roasting of the beans differently. And it tasted more like tea than it did coffee. It's like not acidic, it, it was pretty awesome. So if you haven't tried it, I think uh, Portland will probably be a good place to, to check out some coffee shops. Um, so today we're gonna talk about sprints and releases. I'll give a little bit of history about uh, why we are where we are today in, in most cases. And I think it's important to go back and understand how we got to where we are in order to help us understand how we move forward. Then we'll talk about feature flags. I'll talk about some practical strategies for implementing these things. And then uh, give some success stories and some real life examples and then open it up for questions and conversation uh, about this. I wanna start off with like, this is a balancing act. And I think every organization, every project is gonna be slightly different. And the use cases that you have are gonna be different depending on what your team needs to do uh, how involved your security process is, what type of data you handle, and, and what type of features your applications have. Um, if we just set some ground rules, terminology, a feature uh, is a testable set of functionality in a software application. A sprint is a time max agile iteration with a set of features in it. A release is a uh, stable version with specific features ready for distribution to the public. And a deployment is the process of deploying uh, that release to make those features available. And a bit of history is we got to where we are in software development because of the Agile Manifesto in most cases. That's where two week sprint cycles came about, right? It was about um, putting these processes in place and putting this mindset in place that allowed us to uh, deliver the most optimal iteration of coding with security and testing and uh, like the, the, the balance between uh, time to market and risk <coughs> is, uh, the best that, that it can be. And um, you know this was first introduced in the 90s and it was published later in, in 2000. Um, but this is 24 year old software idiom that we're still using and like living by today. And I think there's lots of parts of this that are still applicable. I think the mindset is still right. Um, but I'm gonna challenge, like, should we still be doing two weeks sprint cycles? Is that still optimal? And with the evolution of technology and tools and uh, really skills, could we be doing things differently? Um, so this is an example of what in a simple two week sprint cycle will look like, right? So um, I might have two week sprints uh, going on every two, and then I probably have a release cycle that maybe goes every four, uh, every four weeks, because once my sprint's done, I need to run UAT, I need to get client approval, I need to go through a change management process, and I need to deploy that code. Uh, but it's gonna happen sometime here in sprint two, or at the end of sprint two, and you'll, you'll just stack those releases. Um, and this ends up with it taking at least a month to get code changes out. 
And that means that you might be going back to your, your customer, and if it's a marketer, you know, I need a button color change. Sorry, it's gonna be a month. That's not something that they like to hear. It's not a good way to work, and it's not necessary, to be frank. Um, so how do we make this possible? How do we make this better? Um, and let's talk about why teams run longer release cycles, right? Let's get in your, get in your heads. Uh, to gain efficiency with resources, right? We organize these features so that we can run QA testing on the full set of features in the sprint. We can run UAT on the same set of features, so that's not something that people have to do every single day. Uh, we can regression test, we can load test, we have release managers, and all of these skill sets can be combined into larger functional packages, and they don't have to be managed at the individual ticket level, or the individual feature level. So we, we think that there's uh, some ability to have more efficiency as we group these things together. The second reason is technical limitations, right? Um, so we've got limited environments. I don't know what hosting providers you use, but a lot of customers only have a production environment. They don't have tests or UAT, and even if they do, it's hard to push things between them, or um, they don't have multi-devs or a CD pipeline that has feature-based environments. Um, deployment methodologies and dependencies between features are two, two other key sets, right? Uh, I can't deploy this until everything else is done because it's coupled together. And um, I think a lot of times uh, this is done for ease of development, it's done for ease of planning, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And then the last one, I originally had this to reduce risk, but I think I'm, uh, I liked perception of reduce risk better. Right? We want to triple check our work. We want scheduled and released and planned uh, times across teams. We want multiple approvals to CYA. Um, also, rollbacks are scary. Like, when's the last time anyone in here did a rollback? Do you remember? Yeah? Recently? No? Yeah, but we have a built-in system for it, so if something goes wrong, we can just hit it. Okay, yeah. Uh, in general, not, not very often. Um, security implementations and then a, phasey, a, a fuzzy understanding of impacts, right? Um, I hope everything goes right. And with the 14 levels of approvals, I've, I've got my, my, uh, my butt covered. Um, so those are some of the reasons why we follow these longer, longer release cycles. And um, let's talk about common trends that teams go through and, and talk about some mindsets that we have, right? So we tend to be inflexible once we define a process. So this is like a two week sprint iteration delivery. And this is probably what most teams here are used to working in some form of this, right? And um, I don't know about you, but when I ask my teams initially, like, hey, can we do a one week release cycle? And it's just like, no, not possible. We've got too many meetings, it's gonna take too much time. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have enough time to get things done. What if we don't finish the ticket by the end of the week? And, uh, you know, it's, it's this mindset that we've always worked in two-week sprints. We're comfortable with this, and, and change is hard. And, um, you know, with this inflexibility, with this process, it leads to, like, UAT not happening for two weeks after a sprint's done. It leads to issues with feedback where, oh, sorry, this one feature that you got in on Friday is blocking your last two weeks of releases. So no features get out for an extra three weeks because it's all tightly coupled together. And we typically put walls around these sprints, right? And it talks about this a little bit already, but feedback from sprint one, like changes to scope. Sorry, you didn't have this in the AC. It's gonna have to wait till the next release because we have to add a new ticket because we're not gonna update the one that we have in the sprint right now, right? Like no, no, no change in scope. Uh, sorry, and that, that leads to a poor customer experience, a poor user experience, a poor team experience uh, when you're talking about stakeholders. Um, and hot fixes are seen as negative um, and only appropriate for critical issues. And again, this is because teams are resistant to change and these rigid rules make us feel secure. They make us feel like if we follow this process, nothing can go wrong. And, um, you know, I think uh, getting teams comfortable with change is hard. 
But once you're in that mindset that it's okay to move fast, it's okay for something to, to, to be an issue or to have something look slightly off when you get it there because you can release again the same day. Like once you get that mindset in your head, then it's a lot less scary. Um, and this isn't something that just your development team has, has to, to manage. It's something that is like organizational, right? You need your stakeholders to understand if you're gonna move faster, they need to be more comfortable with it. Um, but if you're working with marketing teams, uh, you probably know that uh, they kind of like shoot then aim. Um, they just want to get things out. They want to iterate. And they're okay with things being slightly off or, or, or slightly wrong because they'll just go in and make the change. Um, and they'd rather get things out than, um, than sit there and wait a month for it. And these things have uh, a lot of impact as you get into like uh, marketing teams that are running ads and, and paid media. And, conversion rates, right? If you make me wait a month to improve my conversions by 20%, how much revenue is that? Um, so why are we stuck in our ways? Uh, kind of three key reasons. Fear of the unknown, comfort of the familiar and unfamiliar technology. Uh, I know you can't read this, but this is the current MarTech landscape of tools, and those are all logos broken into different categories. There's like 7,000 of them, right? So. The, the, the ecosystem is becoming more complex, there's more integrations, there's more things that we need to worry about. And uh, with that though, everything that we do becomes easier. And technology evolves fast, and containerization has made infrastructure less expensive, it makes it less scary, makes it more scalable. Um, and these are things that are gonna help us break that mindset of the two week release, right? We have more low and no-code options for DevOps and testing frameworks, uh, and there's frameworks to reduce complexity of features. Um, I think the number one thing that I've seen allow us to be successful in this is uh, these feature-based environments. So um, if you can push up a new uh, testable branch for every single pull request you push, then you can test that in the silo. And that doesn't mean that a feature has to be one ticket. It could be a set of tickets that go into a feature branch that get tested and then deployed independently. Um, and uh, with this, testing automation gets easier. I think I learned about Cypress from a uh, presentation here last year. Um, took it back and within a month it was integrated into every one of our customer <coughs> projects. How much we actually wrote tests in it on those projects is another story. Um, but it was really easy to get up, to get started, and to start pulling into into that uh, process. Playwright's another good one. Uh, there's a lot of no-code and low-code tools where you don't need to be technical to do these, so Ghost Inspector, uh, Test Grid, and Lambda Tests are, are some examples of those, um, where they've got like browser plugins to train uh, your testing uh, for it. And these things have APIs, so you can hook them into your CI processes, or you can uh, run them manually after deployments and things like that. And the foundation's already here. Your developers are already embracing these tools. Um, here's an example of some of our, one of our GitHub repos. And uh, we push up uh, multi-devs on Pantheon every time a PR uh, is pushed up. And uh, we've also got uh, some other actions in here for testing my build and uh, running automation tests, um, uh, things like that. And, you know, Dev and QA are already doing all this work on the branch level. And you're making them redo it on Dev, and redo it on tests, and UAT, and redo your smoke tests. And the amount of time that it's going through that uh, with new features coming in and, and changing it is probably taking more time than it would take for you to just launch the thing once it's approved. Um, and, you know, making these things available to a wider audience, right? Like. Does anyone here send their marketing teams or their customers into like multi devs? Yeah? Okay, that's good. Uh, a lot of people don't, right? They only use it for developers. Um, feature releases are easy. Uh, I don't know how many people have used Pantheon's new front end sites, um, but they've, uh, they've changed the model a little bit where they've got um, multi dev branches and then they've got pull request branches. Uh, so they're actually separated out here. And uh, when you merge a pull request into main, 
in uh, uh, the front end builds it with Pantheon, it auto deploys to your production environment. So that feature based workflow is forced on you in that environment. Uh, you can work around it if you want, like build a feature branch that's called dev and one that's called UAT, and you can build standing environments for those things if you need to. Um, but this methodology, especially in the new JavaScript world, is, is kind of already there. We build feature based deployments, people test the button colors right, it goes to production. Why do I need to set, have that, that color sit there for another two, three weeks? And releases already happen outside of our normal sprint cycle. Um, so think about your release packages as feature packages instead of sprint packages. Like, why are you coupling your release to your sprint package? Why can't you release four times in a sprint? Not really any reason um, besides a process or a mindset. Um, and organize your communications around the feature completion instead of the sprint completion. Sure, there's a point here where you weigh, like, I'm doing this six times a day, I'm sending six emails to a stakeholder, okay, maybe I group these features together because they're simple. Um, but you need to weigh that with, okay, I'm making them wait three weeks to get a button color change out. I think that's something that, that uh, I'll keep uh, keep pressuring here, because uh, it's, it's an example that I see all the time. And uh, I think there's keys to success to move faster. Leverage automation, communicate, set your expectations appropriately, and then clearly understand the impact of your features. And I'll talk about this uh, in the next section about Drupal, but uh, one of the questions is, how do we separate our features, and how do we make things less risky when we do this? And I'll go through some practical examples at the code level of how we can do that. I won't get too techy, but uh, we can talk through it. So, all right, that's, that's, my, that's my speech on uh, the background and philosophy and mindsets. Uh, let's talk about Drupal here, and I want to start with what is a feature flag? Um, so it's a software development technique that turns a set of functionality on and off during runtime without new code deployments. Um, Drupal has a lot of these feature flags already built in, and I'll show some examples of it. Um, and I really like this article that I got from uh, Martin Fowler's uh, blog that talks about four types of feature flags or release toggles. You've got, or toggles. You've got release toggles, which is uh, what I'm going to mainly focus on, which is uh, a variation that I push out to turn a feature on or off, and this way I can deploy code to production without it impacting anything on production. Um, and then you get into more dynamic toggles. You talk about personalization, you talk about A-B testing, you talk about uh, segmentation and experiment toggles. Um, and, and these are all types of feature flags. So if anyone's ever implemented personalization on the site, um, it's, a, it's a feature flag to, to turn that feature on for that group of users. Uh, it's the same idea. Um, so why do we use feature flags? Uh, they can be leveraged to break apart the release from it actually being live, and it also gives you the ability to do a no-code rollback. Right? If this didn't work, I turn it off, I clear the caches, and I'm good to go. And with this mindset that the risk of me doing deployments every day isn't there. Right? Like I can push code up and I know it's not going to impact the existing uh, setup because uh, I built feature flags around it, I'm not impacting existing state. Um, and these can reduce risk. Um, so examples of feature flags in Drupal, um, we usually use admin config forms, conditional logic around code features, and helper functions for config imports, for visibility, for things like that. <coughs> At its core, Drupal's module and theme system is a feature flag. You can turn on functionality, you can turn it off. You can do this in production. Um, most people don't do this, makes sense, it's all config managed, um, but there uh, are ways that you can expose those things in, in your theme admin form. I can turn on or off features. And it's that same concept, that same mindset. So it's, it's already baked into our platform and, and the way that we do things. Um, we've just kind of blocked ourselves off because we're scared of it, right? Um, okay, so I just talked about that. Uh, let's take some examples. Um, that's a lot harder to read up here than I thought. So, or this use case, an organization is uh, is upgrading their APIs uh, for for their applications, and uh, they need to keep the existing ones in place, but also make it work for the new ones. 
Um, you know, in actual implementation, you're probably creating another service for it and then changing out uh, conditional flags to swap out all the API calls. And if you have abstracted your code well, it's probably like you know, 10 lines of code that is just one, one call here uh, using an endpoint. So this example pulls a config value from an admin <coughs> called use secure API. And if that's checked, then you'll use the secure API as long as you want. You'll use an insecure one. Um, this is an example of a feature flag that could be implemented for any API or any, any setup that you have. Um, and this allows you to deploy this to production and decouple the release of this feature from, say, your customer go live. And I'll talk about an example of this uh, and what it meant for my team uh, in a few minutes. I don't have a picture for this one, but applying new branding can also be another one. So your company or your site your customer wants to do a rebrand. And we're changing our logo, we're changing our color palettes, we're changing our forms, and you want to release this out. Um, typically, this is more than just a theme change. Uh, if it's a theme change, turn off the old theme, turn on the new one, you can deploy this production, you can test it. Um, in, our, in our case, when we did this, uh, it also uh, rolled out with uh, a lot of other brand changes to like custom functionality and listings, and you know uh, they had new workflows from a merger that they needed to pull in, but it all needed to go live together. So we coupled the theme enablement with feature flags in the admin to change out things that uh, we didn't want to have to sit there and do manually or deploy that night. Um, things like block configuration, things like config updates. And uh, this allows you to swap out uh, other components in there as well. And <coughs> kind of in the same line as a, as a future flight, but kind of a little bit separate. I want to use the example of, uh, of microservices. So an example that can help you move faster is breaking up your application and decoupling it for things that make sense. So we have one example where uh, we've got a marketing site, and the number one goal of this marketing site is to generate leads and forms. And the marketing team spends millions of dollars a day on this. And that meant that a conversion rate change that in pre increased it by 2% was $20,000 a day. $200,000, yeah, $20,000 a day. And they wanted to be able to move faster with this because it meant money in their pocket. So uh, we abstracted out their form logic to uh, a React-based form library called Formic and set it up in its own repo. And now we can deploy updates to their form logic without deploying uh, Drupal. The releases are faster, uh, they're easier, and the risk profile is much more limited. So I don't need to go to my security team and say, hey, we're deploying an application that touches the database, that touches user data, that touches other systems. I'm just deploying a front-end application. Uh, it's usually a much easier uh, conversation and if you can reduce the complexity of your application to reduce the risk profiles, you'll have a much easier time getting these things out. Um, this is overkill for a lot of examples, but there are cases out there where breaking up your application into microservices, different, different repos, and then having that be pulled in uh, can actually speed things up significantly. Um, so if I talk about a success story, we had a customer who was releasing their ordering APIs uh, for all of their downstream vendors. And this was a six month internal process that they went through, rolling out the new APIs, having us test them and do everything else. Uh, they wanted us online for a 16 hour release window overnight to launch everything on their end, integrate it with all the end users, do all the testing and make sure everything was good. And we're like, all right, we're not gonna do that. Uh, we're not, we're not to take the risk of testing this on production when production happens. Uh, and uh, this ended up with my team having to turn on the feature, test it, and they were in and out within 20 minutes of this one though. It was still at like 4 a.m., but um, they, they didn't have to sit there all night and go through this, this complex feature, and we had tested it in dev and test and production uh, before this went live, so this, this was really, really easy for us to do. Um, we got it to production three weeks before uh, they were ready to go live. So we didn't have to do a deployment that night, we didn't have to schedule the whole team and do regression testing that everything there had already been done, and it didn't disrupt the rest of our release cycles. It didn't throw us into chaos. Okay, we can't push any new code because this has to go out. 
Um, and uh, we didn't have any developers have to log into that. It was just the content teams. Uh, we were on standby, but it just it made everything that much easier. So to sum this up, right? In order to break this cycle, it's a mindset thing. It's a uh, questioning why are you doing things this way? And then it's the implementation of automation, of technology, and of communication between your teams to change the process that's happening. And change is hard, I, I get it. Uh, but you know, if you can implement pieces of this, you'll have much happier customers and um, uh, you'll actually be able to do a lot more with a lot less stress than you have with these two release cycles because when one thing goes wrong, you don't blow up everything else. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the current Drupal landscape and then I'll open up for questions. So uh, in Drupal, there's a feature flags module um, that uh, needs some work, but does a, an okay job of setting this up. Um, it lets you set up feature flags. I think it is actually exposes, it can expose that entity as a, an API as well. So you could actually have Drupal manage features for other applications. And that's what a lot of these enterprise options do. So I don't know if you can <coughs> launch Darkly or Split. Um, I split it here twice. Uh, launch Darkly is more product development, but it's basically a third third party system that lets you manage features and then you implement uh, the conditionals via APIs into your application so that I can release features across multiple applications at once. Um, it's also used very heavily in uh, personalization and split tests and um, think about like QuickBooks or Intuit, launching new features out to a subset of customers. Um, Drupal can power all of this. It has APIs, it's built headless. Um, and feature flags can help you do that. Um, otherwise, in core, it's admin forms, it's modules, it's themes, and it's some custom development as you're working through your process. And uh, I can tell you from personal experience that the cost of implementing the admin forms to turn this on or off uh, is much lower uh, than the impact of, of uh, a bug breaking a, a full release or, or stopping you from releasing. Um, because just the, the chaos that goes into that because of what it's blocking might be super important. You might have to spend all night you know, going through the bug and fixing it just to get something else out when that bug didn't even matter, it just is blocking everything you did. Um, so uh, with that, that's what I have for you today. Open up for questions. All right, just a quick question. Did you guys ever go, let's see, you release some features and you didn't use the triple flags on test. Do you ever go back and like remove those flags after a feature is deep stable? Or do you just have a kind of a collection of 20 toggles, you know? Yeah, no, uh, we definitely uh, clean up the deck, right? Like uh, once the feature, especially when they release features, uh, once it's done and we know we're not going back to the old one, then we'll clean up the old APIs, the old flags, and remove the configs um, to, to keep it cleaned up. But it's a good point. Uh, making sure that you have the tickets in there to clean it up afterwards is important. Uh, but it's usually pretty easy to remove good. Yeah. So cool. What kind of like config issues do you, could you run into there just with obviously like, ignoring this feature flag? module, but if it's touching like your API example, maybe that's touching like a handful of other things that you know, need to turn on or turn specific things on. So uh, it's a good question. And it, it really depends on what, uh, what the feature is, right? So there's examples where uh, we're changing the content model of a page and turning the feature flow on for that. And in these cases, uh, it's likely that we'll create new fields uh, or adjustments to fields, and then have the feature flag handle what the display logic is. So it's, again, keeping both uh, current and past states available, or current and future states available, um, and then building the toggles to turn them on. And how you do that is gonna vary based on the, the feature that you're implementing. Um, you know, config ignore can be a really good option for this, for you know, things that are managed in code that you need to be able to change. Um, if it's really complex, a module with an install hook can be used for things like that. Um, it, it just depends on what that, uh, what the profile of that feature is. So I got a two-part question. The first part, does 
your perspective change based on the type of work it is, like iterating on an existing site as part of the maintenance package versus doing a six or eight month build because like the sprint sprawl that happens from missing like early sprints back to that six month project. Sure. And then the second is on the communication side, you have clients, PMs, front end developers, back end developers, in theory should all be aligned at the start of the sprint, even though that can go away as well. It feels to me like sometimes you're halfway through their work and people still don't know what their specific thing was supposed to do. It just seems to be happening more and more, especially with the remote team. So all that's also awesome, like the Teams not in the know with what they're supposed to do, then I feel kind of yeah. All right. So the the first question was around. Uh, yeah, do, do you see this working well? Just like a, a more yeah. redesigned build from sure. scratch, or does it fit better maybe to try as part of a more iterative yeah. piece for the larger site? So for net new builds, uh, we'll typically still run sprint release cycles. Um, because there's not as much value in getting things out faster. We'll still use the, the methodologies for multi-devs and feature branches and get things out. Um, but like, uh, it just it depends on, on what it, I guess what's going on and what the cost of doing more releases is. Um, it's typically um, not needed in those instances, uh, but could certainly be implemented. And as you get further along, closer to launch when you're doing UAT or content migration, you know, that's typically when we would, we would change to it. Um, just because it's it's more of updates and adjustments and new features than it is like building new concept models and stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's a good question. And uh, we, we usually use this for existing sites and ongoing feature development enhancements. Um, and I, I implement it for pretty much every maintenance account that we have. Uh, we look to change them from the two-week cycle or three-week cycle into this, um, let's do things faster, let's do things iteratively. And it, it really fits really well with the Agile mindset. It's just breaking down the barriers that we put on ourselves for these release cycles. Um, and from a team perspective, I think it, it, it's really important to have good architecture and planning on your tickets. Understand what is this feature and what makes this feature complete, um, because your tickets and the way that you organize them are going to matter for how this can go live, right? Like, I can't deploy the front end. Maybe I can. Deploying the front end for a content model when the back end's not created doesn't give me any value. I can't test it really. I'm sure, if I'm using Storybook, I can do some stuff, but um, like, what what is this feature and what makes it complete to to get that out? And by planning the tickets correctly and, and building, like thinking through how you turn them on and off, that'll help you organize that properly. And it'll actually help your team understand better what they're building as opposed to just executing on tickets. Um, so, you know, I think there, there's definitely challenges in how your team works if you're just using them to develop tasks and you do exactly what's in the task and nothing else and you keep your blinders on. Uh, you might run into challenges because they're only testing whatever they're doing. or not having context of the feature they're building, probably a bigger issue that should be addressed at some point, but um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Sorry. Well, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Yeah,